Well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. I hope you are thoroughly enjoying the sessions at Thai Global Summit 2020. Once again, thank you so much for joining us from different parts of the world. All right, so let me now go ahead and talk about the next interesting topic, which is on post-corona reconstitution program, and for which I'd like to introduce Professor Muhammad Yunus. Ladies and gentlemen, he is is a social entrepreneur, banker, economist, and civil society leader who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for founding the Grameen Bank and pioneering the concepts of microcredit and microfinance. He has also received several other national and international honors. Ladies and gentlemen, his objective was to help poor people escape from poverty by providing loans on terms suitable to them and by teaching them a few sound financial principles so they could help themselves. Replicas of the Grameen Bank model operate in more than 100 countries worldwide. It is indeed a pleasure to have you with us, sir, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Muhammad Yunus. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted to be with you and with Thai. Uh, we have a long-term tie with Thai, so it's uh, very uh, delightful to be with you and uh, chat with you in the context of the pandemic. So the pandemic has uh, brought up lots of issues, lots of subjects, and this has been a time for uh, reflection because uh, things were not happening the way it used to happen. Uh, people are locked down and uh, markets are closed down. And, uh, transportation is not working. Planes are not flying and all kinds of things. Uh, that's how it began and I continue to do so. Gradually relaxation came and so on. But it gave us a lot of opportunity to look back and see what's happening. And particularly uh, pandemic itself has revealed uh, all the major uh, weaknesses or the faults of the entire economic system. It revealed it uh, very vividly. Uh, we are familiar with all those problems, all the shortcomings in the economic system, uh, but never saw it so vividly, so clearly, right in front of our eyes. Uh, like one thing everybody felt, uh, India plus uh, all over the world, uh, about how people, uh, suddenly fell from their normal activity and uh, living without income. Uh, suddenly their livelihood disappeared uh, in less than 100 days of beginning of the uh, pandemic itself. Uh, they didn't know how to handle their life in that. It's not millions, it's hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people who uh, had to abandon their income, abandon their livelihood, abandon their food on the table, and suddenly they see it's a completely different way. So that was, uh, that was a vivid description of where people were actually living in this planet, at what level they were living. If one little shop could drop uh, a significant proportion of human life on this planet, almost 50% of the human life, uh, suddenly felt themselves uh, completely uh, out of uh, any source of their livelihood. Uh, they couldn't survive by themselves and government had to come up and uh, give them income support, give them uh, maintenance support and all kinds of things uh, coming out to let them do. Even still today, uh, if you look at the USA, they're talking about the millions of people and uh, uh, receiving unemployment benefits. Uh, to survive themselves and the line is becoming longer and longer. So that led me to think, I'm sure there are others to think then, uh, that way, where actually are people, uh, at what level of uh, economic situation people are living on this planet? Uh, if you try to, if you produce a map of people in terms of daily income, like we define uh, poor people uh, by saying it's a uh, two and a half dollars per day. If you are learning, if you are earning less than two and a half dollars per day, uh, you are poor. If you are above, then you are okay. You are above poverty. Not too far away, but you are above poverty. So, so the deciding line is the poverty line, two dollar fifty cents. Then the next question comes: uh, What about people who are living at the two dollar a day, one dollar a day? 
I'm sure you can measure how many people are living one dollar a day, two dollar a day, three dollar a day, or under two point five dollar a day, under five dollar a day, under ten dollar a day, under thousand dollar a day, under ten thousand dollar a day. You go on and see. You make make a map of people who live under such and such. And all I'm saying, uh, probably ninety five, ninety six, maybe more than that. Uh, you'll see people living very close to those lines where they're two and a half dollar a day, five dollar a day, ten dollar a day. As we go up, if you go to the thousand dollar a day, then it becomes a bit thinner. Up to that, it's become very thick. As you go down, it's a thicker and thicker. Very dense population size. And if you go about uh, ten thousand dollar a day, it becomes very thin. If you go hundred thousand dollar a day, it becomes still thinner. If you get million dollar a day. Very very rare, and if you get hundred million dollar a day, it becomes thinner. This is how. So what I'm saying is, if you whole map, if you look, uh, all the people are very close to the bottom line, the uh, zero income or uh, uh, between zero income and two point five five dollar a day income. This is where, and not too far away from that. Maybe hundred dollar, maybe thousand dollar a day. So all the people are living there. So. Uh, if you go on a map producing for the whole world, you'll see this extreme concentration of people very close to the edge. That's what they are living at the edge, and people are more. All people are living closer to the edge. Very few rare people living far, far away from the edge. That's one part, very clear, and that made us aware. Pandemic has made us aware of, of that, and now we try to make a map of the wealth. Where is the wealth? You go to the two dollar a day people. There's not much wealth left there. Ten dollar, hundred dollar, thousand dollar, not much. If you go up, it's, it's all clean. It's all white space. There is no dot yet. Uh, if you go thousand dollar a day, a little bit of dot one over here, uh, and then if you go to hundred thousand dollar a day, and, and you go, you go on million dollar a day, etc., etc., and then you see at one point all the wealth are bunched up there. The wealth is all. It's not in the rest of the world, but at the high level of world, and a few people, very rare, very few people, not even hundreds. It's in in terms of dozens, probably. They are the people who are holding on to ninety nine percent of the wealth. So the the density of the wealth is in the top. So I said, pandemic has revealed this uh, whole picture uh, that uh, people live in the edge, at the bottom. But the wealth lives in the out way in the sky. So, what kind of world is that? If you uh, now over uh, kind of put these two maps together, it has a strange thing: people on one side, wealth on the other side, an extreme side, and two extremes. In between is all empty. It's empty for the wealth. It's empty for the people. So we have a, a very very funny world where. Actual world, actual people, 90% percent of the people living in the South Pole, and the wealth is all concentrated in the North Pole. So, how do you make this uh, together? Bring them together. This is a challenge. Uh, uh, corona pandemic has revealed, uh, brought us up, and we have lots of discussion on that. How to make them come closer and closer to each other? People moving up, wealth coming down, somewhere in the middle. They will be a kind of overlap. So, people for the first time, people and the wealth will get together. But how do you bring them down? This is an issue. This is a kind of thing. But we have to do that. Second thing on the pandemic side, which uh, kind of hit me uh, when I keep saying that, well, there's a tremendous amount of pressure, tremendous amount of eagerness, desperation to go back to pre-pandemic situation of the world, because they don't like the people don't like. Uh, the businesses don't like, government don't like the way economy has stalled. Economy has kind of uh, came to a dead stop. It doesn't function anymore. So they are very busy, very uh, panicky about getting this whole world move back to the pre-pandemic situation. That raised me a question, and I started started raising this question quickly. Why do you want to go back? What is there to go back to? And it's a very simple question from me, because I thought uh, this is a dangerous uh, action we are taking to go back to the pre-pandemic world. I said pre-pandemic world was a terrible world. 
that's the world which is about to finish us all. And we are coming very close to it uh, every day because of the global warming. That's what we have been shouting, screaming, and saying that the world is at the uh, end of it. Uh, soon, uh, this will be unlivable planet. And we gave numbers, we gave dates, and we gave speed, how speedy it is, and so on. I said, it's like a big train taking all of us together, rushing back to, rushing forward to get to a place where the world will come to a final end. And it's, that end is not too far away. And the countdown has begun uh, before the pandemic came. And suddenly the pandemic came, the countdown has stopped because the train has stopped. The train is not going forward anymore. And that's what we get worried. I said, no, we should be happy. Why should we get worried? We are not going to the debt because that direction is a uh, direction of uh, uh, absolutely certain debt because we are saying that uh, if the global warming goes beyond two degrees Celsius, we are finished and we are very coming very close to two degrees Celsius. We are coming very, very close to 1.5 degrees Celsius and two degrees Celsius is not too far. This is the amount, the, the amount of time we've got. So I said, uh, the, the, we know for sure that as the train was moving at the speed, the high speed, to get to the final station. And that's the end of it. I said, uh, we should be thanking our staff that pandemic came, train has stopped. And I see this is an opportunity. Now that the train has stopped, we can get out of the train and say, we are not going to go back to the train if that's, that's the train which is heading, heading for the uh, ultimate uh, disaster. So uh, going back is, is a suicidal path. Why should they commit suicide? In any, in any sane mind will say, there's absolutely no way I can go back. I don't want to go back. So our decision here, I plead to everybody, decision here at this time, at the pandemic, peak of the pandemic, we say, well, our decision is no going back. We don't want to go back because we don't want to commit suicide because that's absolutely suicidal. That's for sure. And that's not the only thing which is making it suicidal. And I just explained another suicidal issue, wealth concentration. Wealth is kind of taken away from people. People on one in the South Pole and the wealth is in the North Pole. 99% of the wealth is concentrated in 1% of the people. So what kind of world is that? This is a, this is a ticking time bomb. It will explode. It's just waiting to be exploding, exploded. So this, this is not the path that we should do. Uh, this is a completely uh, wrong path. Uh, we definitely, we don't want to go back to that world, which creates this, and it's getting worse every day. Like the global warming getting worse, uh, wealth concentration is getting worse too. And the other thing that, third point that I see that going back is dangerous because of the artificial intelligence. We've been talking about artificial intelligence for some time. We enjoy talking about it. We have fun. How the world will be so different. Every, everything will be done by machine. And we make uh, artificial I mean, uh, uh, science fictions showing that how artificial intelligence will take over. But the real thing is artificial uh, intelligence is already started the work. It's replacing human being on work. Every work we do, human, uh, the artificial intelligence is coming into it. If you are a good writer, artificial intelligence will be showing that they are a better writer and they do a better job in writing uh, fictions, writing uh, stories, writing scientific uh, dissertation, dissertations, uh, journals, whatever. Whatever you do, they will do better because of the nature of the uh, machine that we built uh, for doing the job. So uh, ultimately, uh, we'll be replaced. Today, the projections are that uh, by next 15 years, uh, more than half a billion people who are already in work, uh, very experienced people, will be replaced by machines, the artificial intelligence. And if you go beyond 15 years, it's very quickly will be replaced. Uh, to the extent soon, uh, the entire population will be replaced by the machine because we have no use for anything because they do better and cheaper. And this is the direction artificial intelligence is taking us. And what, uh, what is the outcome of that? The outcome is very soon, like uh, we'll be ending our life by the global warming, by the uh, wealth concentration. This would be another tool, uh, another tool which will kill us uh, on this planet because we become a garbage on this planet. The human being has no use for anything. So it's a useless garbage hanging around there. And maybe artificial intelligence will be smart enough to call up their uh, um, 
pest department control or garbage clearing control, uh, department control, uh, de control department uh, to re remove all these garbage, re remove all these pests around the planet and have it all for themselves. So this is the direction. See whether it makes sense to you, how far, uh, whether you don't go to that extent, but uh, the direction, maybe you feel the same way because this is what we've been saying. So my point is with no going back. The decision is no going back. If you're not going back, going where? That's the question. I said, we, since that we now have, now, have it, now have it opportunity, this is a great opportunity. This opportunity will not be repeated in many, many generations after us. So we have a very exceptional opportunity created by this pandemic. Why? Because the train has stopped and we can get off the train. Now that we get off the train, we build a new train to take us to the opposite direction where there'll be no global warming, there'll be no wealth, con no wealth concentration, there'll be no artificial intelligence. That's it. So we have solved that problem. And people say, ah, this is not easy. We don't know how to do that. I said, of course we know that. We know every bit of it. You know it, I know it, everybody knows it. We know who is contributing to the global warming. How much I contribute, how much you contribute, how much business A contributes, how much business B contributes, everybody knows that. What food contributes to the uh, global warming? Uh, what uh, materials uh, contribute like plastic to the global warming? Uh, what kind of uh, behavior contributes to the global warming? How the forest fires contribute to the global warming? And all of the, we know every bit of it. Science is very clear, but we don't do it. That's the whole thing. We know, but we don't want to act on it. This is the problem. So now pandemic has given a chance to activate us. We have to take the most outrageous decisions right now bold and outrageous decisions, which we never took before, because the only chance we got, if you miss the chance, we are finished. We are, we are, right now, we are the most endangered species on this planet. I repeat, we are the most endangered species on this planet. But we don't care. Our house is burning. We know that our house is burning because of the global warming. And soon it will be turned into ash. But inside, we are having a party. We are enjoying ourselves. Where growth is taking place and prosperity and all technological glamour that is happening, we are enjoying every bit of it because we don't care, or because we are extremely addicted to the life, with the enjoyment that we have in our party. We know that we are in the uh, burning house under a burning roof, but we don't want to wake up and go and stop it. This is the problem. So this is the direction that we are, we are coming to. So we create a new world. A world which will be, as I explained, is the world of three zeros. Zero net carbon emission, zero number one, so that the global one takes place, and we know that how to make it happen. All the thing we have to make decisions. And zero wealth concentration. Wealth will not be concentrated, it will be shared by everybody. So the wealth and the people will merge, not separate it out. And the third one, no unemployment. Uh, artificial intelligence is guaranteeing us 100% unemployment, we want to guarantee 100% employment. So no unemployment, zero unemployment. So zero net carbon emission, zero net uh, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. This is the direction that we want to go. So this is the challenge. This is what we have to perform. And we continue on that path and sue that. And vaccine itself, the again, coming to the pandemic, vaccine itself has shown how ridiculous the world is. Now we are creating, we're just the beginning of the creation of the uh, vaccine haves and vaccine have nots. These are the two uh, profit to be made by the vaccine producers. That's why we're sending out a appeal to the world to declare the corona vaccine uh, as the uh, global public good, global common good, so that there is no patent right over uh, this item, uh, the vaccine. The vaccine can be produced by anybody anywhere. There should not be any patent right. In other words, there should not be any um, uh, corporate control, uh, ownership control, any commercial control over the uh, intellectual property right on that. And once you release it from commercial uh, in, uh, ownership, like uh, it was done in the case of uh, uh, polio, 
Bollywood doesn't have an intellectual property right because the, the inventor himself, uh, Jonas Sark, he himself declared that it, nobody owns this vaccine. Uh, this is a, this is a people's vaccine. It's like uh, it's like sunshine. Nobody can own sunshine. Sunshine for everybody. So vaccine is life. Life is for everybody. Life cannot be owned by money. That I own life because I own them. I own the money. I said, now what is happening? Corona has uh, created this vaccine ocean. Uh, uh, sorry, Corona has created this pandemic ocean. And we are all all sinking all over the world. Everybody, rich, poor, everybody is sinking because uh, we are drowning because the pandemic ocean is uh, entered everybody's life. So we are sinking in that. And some people now design some lifeboats. Now they're saying to everybody that, uh, now you, you want to give it to the highest bidder. If you want to be the highest bidder, if you want to pay them, I'll give it to you. So they are now want to make uh, a, a market communication between life and uh, uh, with the say is uh, life boat. So that whether you can get a life boat, whether you can save yourself, depends on how much money you got. You know, ten percent of the people in the whole world, the living in the rich countries. They have now bought off all the production capacities of all over the world. So very rarely you'll get to uh, uh, the vaccine even in uh, 2021 because the production capacity is almost bought off. And they bought off not because they need it. Uh, countries bought off uh, twice the number of their population. The dosages, twice the number, thrice the number of the population, four times the number of population, five times the number of population, country by country, because they want to be protected. So protected what? I want to have all the lifeboat under me, whether I need it or not, because I have the power. Let them die. Who cares? So the 90% of the people have no lifeboats. So this is the situation that we are going through. That's what about the uh, vaccine is. So vaccine, again, vividly shows what, how people judge between life and money, profit. Uh, this today is a negotiable subject. I can give you the lifeboat. If you be the highest bidder for me, otherwise you die. Who cares? And that die, people die in the ninety percent of the people who are in that situation. Maybe a little bit of adjustment will be done here and there. Some segments of people will get some amount of vaccines, but to get the real vaccine to everybody, you have to remove this uh, patent uh, issue completely out of the picture, so that it can be produced locally without being worried about uh, how much to pay those. Uh, uh, highest bidder people to satisfy them so that I can do, I can get the liberty to use it, use the formula myself and produce it in my country or whatever it is. So this is the campaign now going on. I hope you should, you should join this campaign because this is a, a very important. Unless you can bring that lifeboats to everybody, they will be done, finished. And I mentioned at the beginning, I said that we, I repeated it by saying that we are the most endangered human being is the most endangered species in this world because of global warming, because of wealth concentration, because of artificial intelligence. These are all done, finished. At the same time, now we are adding one more pandemic, vaccine. By denying the vaccine, you make these people endangered species. The, that's a question I raised because this is the vaccine heads and vaccine have nots. This is the thing that will now reveal as we go along. So I'll stop here and let you right. think uh, about thank it. You so much, it Professor thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. I need a pleasure learning from you. Very insightful session. Thank you very, very much. All right, ladies thank and gentlemen, you. please to stay with us. We have another session waiting for you.